Welcome to our Old Testament survey class number three. This one we're going to be covering First Chronicles through the book of Esther. Now, if you were going to be in the in-person class, I would uh, take a second, we would, or take a minute or two, and we'd ask about our homework. Did you learn anything new from your assigned reading in Haley's Bible Handbook? But uh, you get to skip that. So let me start with a brief rant. I need to rant a little bit. I came across this disturbing video on YouTube this week where this guy claiming to be a Christian is trying to discourage people from trying to read through their Bibles in a year. His main reason? Well, because you're going to fail. So so don't even try. He builds, And then he builds up this straw man article, uh, argument saying, well, you have to read 15 chapters a day, you know, and no, you don't. You only have to read about three chapters a day to get through the Bible in a year. And then he says this, pay attention. The other day I was reading through the book Steps of Christ and I came across this passage that really brought this idea home. So here's this quote, here's what it says. It says that there is but little benefit derived from a hasty reading of the scriptures. One may read through the whole Bible and yet fail to see its beauty or comprehend its deep and hidden meaning. One passage studied is of more value than the perusal of many chapters with no definite purpose in view and in no positive instruction gained. In other words, when it comes to studying the Bible, many times less is more. Now, if you look closely at the quote, it comes from somebody named Ellen G. White, who is the founder of Seventh-day Adventism, a group that most consider Christian, but one that goes a little bit off the rails on more than a few doctrines. Walter Martin used to classify them as a Christian cult. The fellow in the video encourages people to only read short passages and then discuss them with their friends. Now, that's not a bad idea. That's really good. But if you've never read the entire Bible and reading the entire Bible isn't a regular practice of yours, you're going to lose sight of how the entire Bible fits together. This is how cults start, by keeping you from seeing the context and balancing scripture with scripture. I like this video better. Put your hand up if you've read the Bible from cover to cover. Okay, okay, forget the index and the maps, you know. <laughs> Genesis to Revelation. All right, hands down. The rest of you, okay, chill out about it. Don't feel too guilty yet. <laughs> Listen, when you get to heaven, it's gonna be a little bit awkward. Because you're going to get there and Peter's going to go, welcome, we've been expecting you, come on in. Oh, let me introduce you to Obadiah. Obadiah says, did you like my book? <laughs> you go, book, what book? <laughs> and then he introduces you to Zephaniah. Zephaniah says, did you like my book? <laughs> oh, you wrote a book as well? Listen, you're not going to be able to have conversations with certain people. I'd urge you and encourage you, don't put yourself in that situation. Seriously. This is the only reliable data that we have about God. Now, I don't want to be legalistic about how much of your Bible you need to read every day, but you ought to be in a habit of reading every day. And I also think it's very important that you have a plan to get yourself through the Bible, whether it takes one year, two years, three years. Gosh, if you just read a chapter a day, you get through it in three years, but then do it again and again. Don't be afraid of reading the entire Bible. Your first three or four times through, you're going to have lots of questions, but don't let the questions stop you. Keep reading. Pastor Chuck used to talk about having this file in his head labeled, waiting for further information. I think that's a great concept. File away, circle, write down those things you don't understand, and then move on. There's a lot of resources available to answer your questions. There's Haley's, there's good commentaries. You've got lots of pastors around here, uh, brothers and sisters, and yes, you can even ask me a few questions. 
but an awful lot of your questions will be answered little by little each time you get through the Bible. You'll start making these connections. Hey, hey, this passage is talking about this. Or, or you'll hear Pastor Bob teaching on a passage and you'll think, that's one of those things I've always wondered about. Just keep reading. One of my goals for this class is to get you hungry about reading the Bible and give you enough confidence to, that you'll take on the challenge of reading every day. Now, if you really want to read through the Bible in a year, it's only three chapters a day. The bigger issue, other than how much you got to read every day, is the establishing of a daily habit. Get to the point where you don't even think twice about spending 15 or 20 minutes reading. You've already got it built into your day. Okay, that's it. Now, one more thing along these lines. Reading and teaching through the Bible is a part of the Calvary Chapel movement's DNA. Many years ago, a young pastor, Chuck Smith, was leading a small church. For years, he had a two-year supply of topical sermons that he'd use up before deciding to move to a new church. But one time, he found a church that he really liked to pastor. In fact, the, the, I've heard that the real reason was because it was down by the beach and he liked to surf. And he, won, and he was running out of material. And he eventually would come across uh, this in Haley's Bible Handbook. There's a little chapter that used to be in the back of the book called The Most Important Thing in This Book. I'm afraid that they no longer have this section in the more recent editions, but I've made copies of it out of my old copy that dates back to 1978. Chuck would come across as maybe 15 years or so before that. And I'm going to be sending you a section uh, of this section when I send up my notes on Monday. Haley's challenge to pastors was to learn to teach through the entire Bible. He said it would revitalize the church. And it's because of this that Pastor Chuck shifted his teaching style from being topical studies to learning to teach expository messages going through the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And that's what you've experienced here at CCEA under, under Pastor Bob. Calvary Chapel owes much to the ministry of Henry Haley. That's one of the main reasons why I've made this our extra textbook besides the Bible. Now, let's get into the book of First Chronicles. Who's the author? I'm going to say Ezra. Now, this is not agreed by all scholars, but Ezra makes the most sense. The Jewish commentary, known as the Talmud, says that Ezra was the author. Um, Ezra also has a book named after him. We'll talk about this in a few minutes. He was a scribe. And he was a priest from the tribe of Levi and even a descendant of Aaron, the original high priest. And uh, you will definitely see a priestly influence and flavor in this book. Now, when did he write? Get used to these dates. You're going to say that, re write this down a couple of times. I'd say 450 to 425 BC. And that puts this in the lifetime of Ezra. And you can peek at your timeline later. Um, to see where this fits. Originally, First and Second Chronicles were a single book before they got separated into two. Why was it written? I'm going to say this is a history from a post-exile perspective. The nation of Judah had, had been in exile for 70 years when they were allowed to return to the land of Israel from Babylon. Why had they been in Babylon? Well, the author is going to give us a bit of God's slant on things and how, how the Jews got to where they were. That's kind of, that's what's behind this book. First Chronicles will start with about nine chapters of genealogies. Then there's a chapter on the death of King Saul. And from chapter 11 to the end, it details out the history of King David. Um, now, there's not just some overlaps with the accounts of, of 2 Samuel. There are some overlaps. But Ezra has added a, a whole bunch more, collected from various additional source material that was at his disposal. The book ends with some interesting details about how King David organized the worship of, um, uh, of the nation. Um, and even though he wasn't allowed to build the temple, 
he was given a blueprint by God of the temple and allowed to amass all the materials needed for Solomon to construct the temple. You only see that in, in, in Chronicles. David also reorganized the Levites to prepare them for temple worship. There's also a bit, quite a bit about David organizing the musicians. If you're a worship leader, the Chronicles are books that you ought to get familiar with. There's some interesting lessons and pictures in the Chronicles. And keep in mind, David was not just a warrior or a king. He was, he was a worshiper. He was a musician. He wrote many songs. We'll get to that next week. Uh, I'm going to talk for a second. Here's my, my another rabbit trail. I'm going to talk about words of worship. Because that's kind of what Chronicles is about. And Christians are often confused about this word worship. For many contemporary evangelical Christians, worship is that part of the service where we sing songs. Or maybe we think it's the band is singing the song, but that falls far too short of what biblical worship is. Besides the music, let me give you three more words that define worship. Next word I would like to pick out is the word yield. In the Old Testament, there are several words that are used for worship in the Hebrew. One word is kadad, which means to bow down. Another is chawa often translated just as worship, but also carries the idea of bowing down or prostrating, lying out flat before God. When Abraham's servant um, found a bride for Isaac in Genesis 24, 26, it says, then the man bowed low, that's kadad, and worshiped the Lord, that's hawa. Both words are used there. The idea of bowing is the idea of yielding. It's, it's acknowledging that there's someone greater than you are that's worth worthy of you bowing to. We may not physically bow in church, but we definitely need to work at yielding to God. Um, another word is the word adore. I'm going to use that word. It, there's a word in Greek that I love. It's the, it's the word proskuneo. And yes, it, it carries the idea of prostrating oneself before another, but it also literally means to kiss toward. I've always looked at this word as kind of the emotional part of worship where we express our love and our adoration to God. And your hands might go up, but not necessarily. When we sing in church, we understand that music has inherently built into it this emotional, emotional component. It's about loving God with your heart and with your soul. Uh, and it's not just about music. It goes beyond music. Jesus used this word when he said in John 4, 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The spirit is about your spirit touching God's spirit. And worship ought to be wrapped up in truth, the truth about God, the truth about us and our need for him. That word, that's the word adore. That's a part of worship. And the last word I want to talk about is the word to serve. Another Greek word that's often translated worship in the New Testament is, um, is latruo. Um, this word has a Levitical component to it. It ought to make you think about how the Levites and the priests worshipped or served God in the tabernacle or the temple. A Hebrew parallel word is abad, and it means to work or to serve. But this idea to serve is a part of worship. Paul will use this word here in Romans 12.1. You know this verse. Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of Latruo. Or here it's Latreia, but it's worship. Um, it's like the Levites presenting a sacrifice. How did the Levites and priests offer worship to God? Well, they brought sacrifices, they prayed. They sang and played instruments. They taught the people. They performed all the duties that were required to keep the temple going, like lighting the menorah, 
offering incense and putting out the showbread, uh, even sig- seemingly insignificant things were part of their duties, like guarding the gates, counting the offerings, and keeping the temple clean. That's what you'll see in First Chronicles, the different ways that God has worshipped through serving. It's all about the things we do to serve and honor God. All of this, all of this, music, yield, adore, serve, this is all worship. Now, here's where you want to write down your answer for the quiz at the end of class. The question is, what best describe biblical worship? Is it A, music, B, yielding, C, adore, D, serve, or E, all of the above? What do you think? I hope I made it clear. Um... It's the last one. It's all of it. All of it is worship. Okay. And uh, is there anything messianic in First Chronicles? Yes. Uh, God will promise David about a son. It says in First Chronicles seventeen twelve, He shall build for me a house. I will establish his throne forever. It's very similar to the passage we saw in Second Samuel. God promises that he'll have a son who will have a forever throne. That's not Solomon. That's Jesus. A significant verse you might be surprised at my pick here. You'll probably, I'm sure you're going to be surprised. It's 1 Chronicles 6, 33 and 34, where it says, These are the ones who served with their sons. From the sons of the Kohathites were Haman, Haman the singer, the son of Joel, the son of Samuel, the son of Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Eliel, the son of Toa, and it goes on with this genealogy. This is right in the middle of the long list of, of nine chapters of genealogy. And I'm going to come back to this for a minute. But you're, I want you to think, what is he talking about? Why is that such a big deal? First, let me give you a word about genealogies. There are several genealogies through the Bible that are given at various places. And for most of us with Western eyes, this is, uh, is we have a problem because all we see is just a bunch of names. And maybe we're afraid of trying to pronounce the name, so we just skip them. But genealogies are what tie the scriptures together. They show us that the Bible is not just a bunch of random stories about people with no connection to each other. Some of you were probably a bit surprised last week when I told you that Boaz, who married Ruth, uh, was like the great grand grandfather of David. He was the son of Rahab the harlot. How do I? How did I know that? Because the genealogy told me that. This is all about connections. If nothing more, you're going to see that God kept His promise to David to have a son who had a th- has a forever throne. That's Jesus. That's how do you track that through the genealogies? You will also learn that there's m- many names where there's. More than one person with the same name. There's more than one Caleb. There's more than one Korah. There's more than one Gomer. You're going, what? What? Not Gomer Pyle, but there's another Gomer. A couple of Gomers. So how do you tell them apart? Well, you have to ask the question, who are they the son of? That's how you identify people. Now, some of you might remember that there was a little book that came out around 2000 by Bruce Wilkinson called The Prayer of Jabez. And it's found in the genealogies of First Chronicles. First Chronicles 4, 9, and 10 says Jabez was more um, honorable than his brothers. And his mother named him Jabez, saying, because I gave birth to him in pain. His name has something to do with pain. It says, now Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, oh, that you would greatly bless me and extend my border and that your hand might be with me and that you would keep me from harm so that it would not hurt me. And God brought about what he requested. Now, if you skip the genealogies, you'd miss that gem. For me, I got pretty excited one day reading through 1 Chronicles 6. I made one of those connections like I had never seen before. Some of my excitement came when I read that one of the first of the three major worship leaders, that's a whole nother subject. You should look this up and you'll see that there's three major worship leaders. But one of them was a guy named... Haman, Haman, who was a grandson of the prophet Samuel. Now, how do I know who the prophet, that's the prophet Samuel and not somebody else? Well, because of his father's name, which matches another place where we know this is the prophet Samuel. 
I was also excited to see that Samuel's family wasn't a total loss. If you're reading the book of 1 Samuel, you read that Samuel's sons didn't follow the Lord. Ah, but his grandson did. And lastly, I was always a bit bothered about Samuel performing so many sacrifices in 1 Samuel because I thought he was from the tribe of Ephraim. It says in 1 Samuel 1.1, 1, 1, there was a man from Ramathaim Zophim from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. Now, I knew that the law stated that only those who descend from Aaron, who's from the tribe of Levi, are allowed to perform sacrifices. But when I continued reading in 1 Chronicles 6, I realized that Samuel was a descendant of Aaron. In fact, he's a Kohathite. That's a tribe that descends. Uh, that's part. That's that's the priestly sub-tribe of, of the Levites. And that simply what what first what uh, what first Samuel one one is saying is not that he wasn't a Levite, but that he's a Levite living in Ephraim. He wasn't from the tribe of Ephraim. He was a Levite living in Ephraim. Isn't it funny how things that us nerdy pastors get excited about? Genealogies are about making connections. Don't skip them. Second Chronicles. The author is Ezra. When? Say 450 to 425 BC. Why? Again, history from a post-exile perspective. The book of Second Chronicles will cover the time of Solomon through the Babylonian exile. Now, as we talked about last week, after Solomon, the kingdom of Israel splits. There's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. But the author of Chronicles only follows the history of Judah, the southern kingdom. You're not going to see this back and forth between the north and the south and the, all these different kings. We're only going to follow the kings of the south. That's where the temple is. And again, keep in mind that Ezra is a priest. And so he's going to add all kinds of two juicy tidbits he finds in the records about how the kings treated the temple, the prayers of the kings, the worship of God. You're going to hear several times what I'd like to call, well, you can call it their national anthem. I like to call it Israel's worship chorus, a, re a refrain that's sung over and over again. And it's this, he is good. His mercy endures forever. Sound like any, you've, you've heard that in any songs? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Sorry, my hoarse voice. This is Israel's worship chorus over and over. A significant verse. It's hard to pick just one, but perhaps one of the most important ones for the people of Ezra's day is this, where God is responding to Solomon's prayer of dedication at the temple, and God tells the nation what to do if they are ever going astray. Second Chronicles 7, 14 says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I think this was what Daniel was responding to in Daniel 9 when he realizes that the nation's been in Babylon for the for the prophesied 70 years and it's time to go home and he starts praying and confessing the sins of the people uh, this is a great verse let's go to the book of Ezra uh, the author uh, it's Ezra and by the way his name means comes from Etzer which means help his name means help he's a great help to the nation same time frame, 450 to 425 BC. Why? I'm going to say this is all about the restoration of worship. Worship is restored. The book documents the waves of people returning to Jerusalem from Babylon. Under King Zerubbabel and Jeshua the high priest, an altar is set up and sacrifice to Yahweh begins. Then they lay the foundation of the new temple. Then there's opposition to the temple construction, but eventually under the encouragement of the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the temple's finally finished. And it's after this that we read about Ezra making his way to Jerusalem from Babylon to help further the work of the temple 
and to teach the people God's ways. That's what this book's all about. A significant verse, um, Ezra 7.10. It says, For Ezra had firmly resolved to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. This is Ezra explaining how he was able to make the dangerous journey from Babylon to Jerusalem. He said, God's hand was on me. Why? Because of this. This is what Ezra is all about. For preachers, hey, there you go. Here's a four-point sermon, all, all practically built in there for you. Resolve, study, practice, and teach. How about that? How about that, teachers? Four-point sermon right there. The book of Nehemiah. The author, I'm going to say this time it's Nehemiah. I think Ezra might have had a hand in writing some of it. But it's pretty clear that most of the book contains the memoirs of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the Persian king Artaxerxes. And that, that made him a pretty important person in the empire with access to the king. Haley suggests, you might have read this, that Nehemiah, as a Jew, might have been able to get the job he had because of how God used Queen Esther. And remember, they're all in the same time frame. And we'll talk about Esther in just a minute. Um, When is this book written? I'm going to say, again, our familiar time frame, 450 to 425 B.C. In the oldest Hebrew manuscripts, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah are a single book. Nehemiah will get to Jerusalem 12 years after Ezra does, but their lives are going to overlap. Why is the book written? This book is about the rebuilding of the walls, building the walls of Jerusalem. This is Nehemiah's main goal. He hears about the walls torn down. He's torn to pieces. He says to the king, can you help me with this? I want to go and help my people rebuild the walls. The walls of a city are what keep the city from being invaded. And when Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem, the walls around the city are nothing but rubble. And he's going to organize the Jews that are living in Jerusalem and they will resist the opposition against them, and they will rebuild the walls. Awesome, awesome book. A significant verse. This may not be the verse in Nehemiah for most, but as a preacher, this is my favorite verse. Here's the scene. The scribe Ezra has gathered the people together in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. It's kind of a first for them. This gathering involved a little bit of teaching as well. Ezra stands on a platform above the, above the crowd and he had a group of priests around him who would repeat everything he said so the crowd could hear it all. And then there's this nugget. Okay, preachers, pay attention. Nehemiah 8.8. 8. So it says, So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God and they gave the sense and help them to understand the reading. This is what preaching and teaching is supposed to be all about. It's about reading clearly from the book. The congregation, your Bible study, your Sunday school class needs to know that what you're talking about indeed comes from God's word. You need to give the sense. In other words, a good teacher doesn't just read the words, but helps to explain so that the congregation understands what the scripture is saying. Use simpler language. J. Vernon McGee used to say this, and I think I've mentioned this before. Put the cookies on the lower shelf so everyone can get to them. For those of you who teach children's ministry, and I know several of you do, this is your challenge as well. Can you find ways to explain to the children in words they understand what God is wanting them to know. Nine-year-old Joey was asked by his mother what he had learned in Sunday school. Well, Mom, our teacher told us about how God sent Moses behind enemy lines on a rescue mission to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. When he got to the Red Sea, he had his engineers build a pontoon bridge and all the people walked across safely. Then he used his walkie-talkie to radio headquarters for reinforcements, and they sent bombers to blow up the bridge, and all the Israelites were saved. 
Now, Joey, is that really what your teacher taught you? His mother asked. Well, no, no, Mom, but if I told it the way the teacher did, you'd never believe it. Ha. So, read the book, give the sense, and bring understanding. The whole goal of teaching is to understand. If you come away from a sermon or a Bible study and you're not sure what the teacher was really trying to say, well, there's a problem. If your class doesn't understand what you're trying to say, there's a problem. Understanding is, is the key. Okay, let's move on to the book of Esther, our final book. The author, I'm going to say Mordecai. To, it might be the author. Mordecai was the cousin of Queen Esther, and he's also a major character in the book. When was it written? I'm going to put it about 464 B.C. Um, why? Well, this is a book about God's deliverance of the Jews. The story of Esther is not just about how a young Jewish girl became the queen of Persia, but how God used her and her cousin Mordecai to rescue the Jews from the plot of the wicked man Haman who was intent on wiping out all the Jews. Her story takes place about 40 years after the temple in Jerusalem had been rebuilt. Now, some have questioned whether this book should be part of Scripture because God is not mentioned specifically in the book. But you'd have to be a fool to read this book and think that he's not involved when you see how he is maneuvering individuals and he rescues the Jews. Also, the Feast of Purim uh, is a Jewish tradition that comes from this book. It's celebrating when God used Esther and Mordecai to rescue the Jews. A significant verse, Mordecai is the one who uncovers the plot of Haman to have all the Jews in the Persian Empire destroyed. When Mordecai asks Esther to step up and speak to King Ahasuerus about this, she's reluctant at first. The rule was that if someone came to the king, even if it's the queen, and they come without his permission, they could be put to death. So she's just a little bit scared about this. But Mordecai says this to her, Esther 4.14, For if you keep silent at this time, liberation and rescue will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained to royalty for such a time as this. I think that's a great verse. Now, that's kind of it for the books, but let me just, of the history books, but let me say this, is that it? This ends the, the Old Testament history books. As Haley points out, the last three Old Testament prophets, we'll get to them in a bit, in a few weeks, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi all fit in this time frame within Ezra and Nehemiah. There will be about 400 years before the events of the New Testament begin to unfold. Haley has titled this uh, uh, the 400 years, um, he's entitled this section of history, the 400 years between the Testaments. The, and, and he gives some background about this time. Some have referred to this period between the Testaments as a time when God was silent. But was God really silent during this time? I kind of think it's like the book of Esther. God was indeed at work. We may not have prophetic books written during this time. In this, and, and, and in that sense, maybe God was silent, but God was far from being inactive. The Jews were not inactive. You can read some of the historical records of these times in what is known as the Apocrypha. This is a set of books that the Catholic Church likes to consider as part of the Bible, though we don't. Uh, the books are just a tad off doctrinally, so Protestant churches and even the Jews don't consider it as uh, inspired, but they do have a great deal of historical material. Here's what will happen during those 400 years. The Greeks will conquer the Persians of Nehemiah's day. They will rule the land of Israel. The Greeks will. For a short period of time, the Jews will revolt against the Greeks, and for about a hundred years, they'll have their own short-lived kingdom known as the Hasmonean Kingdom. Uh, and then Rome will move in and conquer everything. But wait, there's more. I think there are several significant things 
that we don't often pay much attention to that happened during these 400 years. First, there is the synagogue. The Jews will develop this concept of meeting together on Shabbat during this time. Prior to this, they didn't meet together once a week. It was this time that developed this. Um, secondly, there's the concept of the rabbi. The Jews will develop schools to train men to teach God's word. We think Ezra may have been a huge part of this. The nation had gotten itself into so much trouble because they had strayed from God's word. And so men like Ezra will study and train others to teach the people in the synagogues. And then there's the returns. I'm not talking about taking your stuff back to Kohl's or uh, getting, getting Amazon to give you a refund. I'm talking about the, the waves of refugees that will return from Babylon to Jerusalem and think, uh, well, we think that, that, that they only returned to Jerusalem, think that that's all there was. And initially, the Jews settled only in the south, in the land of Judah. They are the ones who would rebuild the temple and set up the rabbinical schools in Jerusalem. But there were also rabbinical schools developing in Babylon as well. These schools developed a different flavor. They were a bit more charismatic, I'm going to say, than those in Jerusalem. And around 100 B.C., a new wave of Jews began to immigrate from Babylon to Israel. But because the South was already so well developed and populated, this new wave of immigrants would settle in the North, in the area of the Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee. I believe this is why Babylon in Matthew 1 is mentioned as one of the time markers in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus because of this Babylonian infusion into Galilee. When Jesus arrived and began his ministry in Galilee, there were already well-established schools in Galilee, and they were indeed a bit more charismatic than those in and around Jerusalem. They believed in and practiced and experienced miracles they believed in the work of the Holy Spirit, and it's in this context that Jesus will arrive. Now, let's talk about homework. Your homework, it's not a whole lot this week. I want you to read in Haley, there's a little section called Poetry and Wisdom. It's found before the book of Job. It's only about three pages. Don't get into the stuff about Job. You don't need to do that. I want you to read in Haley's, there's a section, an introduction to the book of Psalms and read right up to where it actually starts talking about individual Psalms. And again, there's only maybe five pages, four and a half pages there. And I want you just, just for the heck of it, I want you to see if you can find an answer to this question. How many authors were there to the book of Psalms? How many songwriters? So there's your homework for the week. And again, I will email this out. Now it's time for your quiz. What best describes biblical worship? Is it A, music, B, yielding, C, adoration, D, serving, or E, all of the above? If you, are, if you missed class on Sunday and you're watching this, I want you to email me, email me your answer so I'll give you credit for watching the video and for getting your quiz right. Next week, we're going to be uh, covering the book of Psalms. It's only 150 chapters. Ought to be easy peasy, right? Okay, I pray that God would bless you this week and that he'd give you a hunger for his word. In Jesus' name, amen.